chat back and forth about it because there's usually a lot of a lot of titles for any one book that you can think of. Mm -hmm. um, and because I'm so close to the book, I tend to pick okay, titles that are going to be too obscure, <laughs> just because I know it's in the book, but it, the reader won't know that flashing by in the bookstore, you know. And so the book has to be, the title has to be a grabber, like the art has to be a grabber. So I, those sway toward marketing decisions. I have never had a problem with what I wanted to write for the actual story. Nobody's mm -hmm. ever asked me to do it differently or asked me to. Um, I'll get edit, editorial requests, but they're along the lines of, can you clarify the motive here, you know, motivation here, can you, um, um, and sometimes because the writer is so close to the book and she knows what the character was thinking, she forgot to put it on the page, that, that kind of thing. That kind of, that's usually what editing entails, because your editor is reading it for the first time cold, right? She doesn't, I've spent months on it, so I'm really too deep in the weeds is what happens. She's just reading it cold, so she will be my first reader, and if it's tripping her up as a reader, then I know it needs fixing. So, uh -huh. And that's what, that's what editing. The, a lot of people who are doing self-publishing mistake copy editing for what we think of as, as real editing, yeah. And copy editing is basically fixing the grammar and, and mm -hmm. spelling and that kind of stuff. Um, but when, you, when, a, when a writer speaks of her editor, she's talking about the one who is um, reading the book for coherence and clarity and motivation and characterization and those kinds of things are what an editor really does. So. Do you always have the same editor? Do you use the same editor? Or well, does it change? I, you, you, tend to, you tend to get bought by an editor. Like if you move from one publisher to another, you're going to go to a, you're, some editor bid on you and is, try, is offering you this contract. So you're going to have to, you're stuck with that editor. <laughs> if, you, if you take the money, you're going to have to work with that editor. That's yeah. kind of what it comes down to. Um, that said, apparently there's all kinds of situations where um, editors and writers don't get along. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's a collaborative kind of situation. It, it doesn't get along. You can certainly request a new editor. Um, but most people, when they make the decision to take the contract, that's because that editor really loved their stuff and wants them. And so there's, you're going to somebody who has reason to love you already, you know, mm -hmm. so it's probably going to be a pretty good And supportive of the Yeah, otherwise they wouldn't have offered you the contract. Yeah. Oh, so. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. yeah. Interesting. How did you get your first agent? My first agent? Um, at a writer's conference. Which is, if you're, are you interested in writing? Are you, are you kind of looking into it? I really highly recommend joining uh, one of the local writers organizations because that's where, that's where you're going to run into them face to face. Uh, we have a couple of really good ones in this area. One is the uh, Pacific Northwest Writers Association. Yeah, I've been to several. Okay. Um, there's one. There's another organization for um, people who are writing um, LGBT fiction um, called Old Growth Northwest. And there's Romance Writers of America, which covers everything I write is covered at that conference. Um, and those, those, the, there's also if you're really serious about it and you're not meeting the ones you want to meet, if you Google an operation called Publishers Lunch or Publishers Marketplace, either either Publishers Lunch is what comes in my email from Publishers Marketplace every day. But if you Google either one of those, and it, should you choose to subscribe, it's, it's not that expensive, it's just a few bucks a month. It's basically a newsletter to the industry. But one of the things they offer is a database of who represents who. So for example, say you wanted to write um, in a field of uh, paranormal fiction like uh, um, J.R. Ward, for example, a vampire writer. She's not a vampire. <laughs> Characters. Well, now that we know. <laughs> <laughs> Clarify that. Yeah. Um, if this database, if once you join, uh, allows you to search who represents J.R. Ward, see, and then you can backtrack and find the name of the agency. That's so. That's a little trick for finding an agent. I throw out there. Because I read when I read books, I always read the author's notes, uh -huh. and I've been collecting. Who they say their agent is, yeah. or something? Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you're that deep into it, then by all means, you might want to take a look at the Publishers Marketplace, okay. and 
But I mean, did you, when you met your first agent, did you just say you wanted to look at some of my stuff? No. Or did she or he did gave me, to you? He gave oh, me a okay. comp. He gave me a um, They're always headhunting. They're always looking. And I, I had already mean. started publishing with good old Harlequin. Remember Harlequin? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. where I, yeah. yeah, at the time. So um, he was out looking for, you know, to pick up um, new authors to represent. So that, the, now the very, that, I, I should clarify, that was actually my second agent. I think my very first agent I found through the mail, <laughs> which is like a mail order bride, not the best way to go, maybe. <laughs> um, did you get published with that agent? I, I did get published, but I also got really ripped off. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, and I, but I was off, that was before the world is, as we know it today, where there's ways of yeah. talk, finding out information like that. I was just operating out in the cold. Um, so I don't really count her. <laughs> um, but the, the writers' conferences were a good way to, to, meet, to meet some agents. Yeah. And try Romance Writers of America if you're doing anything in women's fiction, because it's such a broad organization right. now. I mean, there's like 10,000 members and people writing everything from what we think of as um, straight women's fiction all the way to paranormal futuristic stuff. It's really a broad and a lot of suspense. And their conferences attract a lot of people from New York. So, huh. And they have local chapters. There's like the Emerald City Writers Group here. So, so. And you can find them online at rwa.org if you're interested. Yeah, I want to ask about, um, there's a, um, for voiceover, um, you know, just because I had done that before. Um, so I had a friend that was talking to me, and they said, hey, you need to go to ACX. And, and, and it's, uh, so it's an Amazon thing where people are putting their books up for people to read them. Uh -huh. And, so, and, and like there's some authors there that, that, that are bringing their books back. You know, mm -hmm. like they might have been popular about 10 years ago or something. Uh -huh. And they're asking for, um, they have this whole shebang going on. You know, like, so if you're going to be the person reading the book, then you might want to also think about getting a, a little mini sound thing going on in your, you know, house. Mm -hmm. Because I guess the way you read them, I mean, it's it's more of a flat read. I mean, they do the processing of that, and, and they, they, well, you have to edit it and everything. So you literally could have a producer and a, and a, and a voiceover person. They're trying to make a book read it. Well. Now, they're not reading the book aloud, but it, it's like a... No, they are reading it. Oh, they're reading it. Yeah, this book's on tape. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay. Right. I didn't explain that. But, but they, yeah. they and, and I did, I checked it out very briefly. And um, uh, heck, they got, a, they got a big thing going on there. Amazon, everything they do is big. <laughs> yeah, I, I, did, I did notice which <laughs> they had, you know, was really getting into romance novels. And um, there were certainly a number of those, and they were paying a high price for their narrators. <laughs> because you'd be black it is the It is the biggest selling genre. There's just no question about it. It's bigger than all the others. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so. And it's because more women read fiction than men. So yeah. whatever women read in general is going to be bigger <laughs> overall. Um, men, women are just the biggest consumers of fiction, popular fiction, so. all across the board. I remember when I was in college, I mean I had heard of romance fiction before but had never really been, had read it. And back when I was at that age, you know, in my teens and twenties, and all the Harlequin stuff was really big, and the bodice rivers, and they were, they were kind of funny, with not intending to be funny, I thought. And then when I was in college, I worked on the paper, uh -huh. and I interviewed, I can't remember her real name, but her author name is Sandra Brown. Oh, yeah, that's her oh, real name, actually. Oh, okay, you're right, that's right. <laughs> Who would make but, up that name, right? Yeah, Sandra Brown. I, I was, <laughs> Lord, talking to her. She, and she really? was, I mean, this it completely opened up this whole thing. And her, I read all her books. Yeah. Over like a year, I just read all her books. Yeah. She writes straight suspense now, but yeah. there's always a relationship yeah. in it. Yeah. A lot of the writers that are very popular in suspense yeah. came out of romance, like Tess Garrison and, uh, and Sandra Brown, um, Iris Johansson. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They all started in romance. And to this day, their books all have, at their core, will be the, a, a relationship, yeah. an important relationship that's driving the story. Well, the, the thing that changed it for me was that hers was the first stuff that I had seen 
it was more modern. Oh, the contemporary it, settings. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I never right. actually read the historicals myself either, even though I was coming up at the same time. Um, I knew the names. There was Rosemary Rogers, mm -hmm. Kathleen Woodowis. Um, those were the two big, big ones. And but the historical format didn't really appeal to me. Little did I know I ended up writing it, but yeah, not on that. <laughs> these writers' careers take odd twists and turns along the way. But when, the, when I fell in love with the books and wanted to start writing my own, it was the contemporary and the futuristic that appealed from the very beginning. In fact, the very first book I ever wrote was a futuristic, which is way ahead of the market, which is not a good place to be. <laughs> I can tell you right now. No one's ready for you. Right. Yeah, timing is everything, and, um, and I was way ahead on that one. But, um, but eventually, I was able to go back to it because it kind of coalesced into a, a subgenre. Right. And, and the dust bunnies took over. So <laughs> just, how, how big are the dust bunnies? <laughs> I don't know. They, they, I have them sit on the shoulder, so I assume oh. it's like like a large parrot. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Or a cat. Are you a Star Trek fan? A triple. Yeah. It's a triple. Okay. Yeah. I think of them as a very oh. fluffy triple, oh, but okay. with teeth and eyes. <laughs> and, a, and a psychic bond. Oh. oh. There's something going on with these critters. And I mean, I, I love I love the Jane Castle books. I love them. I just can't get enough of them. <laughs> there's something going on with those critters. You and figure there's a deeper meaning there. Oh, now, <laughs> see, there's, they, they, they know what's going on, and the humans are just stumbling around. I think what they, I think what they, as I have found out, as you have found out in the books, what it turns out is that, like dogs, they just have a lot in common with us, and so they're easily adapted. They, they get this, you know, they go for the same kind of thrill, they go for the same adrenaline rush, they go for food, you know, they've got... The bling. The bling, yeah. 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 Like the I'm bling. not sure dogs are big on bling, but, um, well, but I, you know, I, how many times have you felt you had, like, some kind of bond with, a, with an animal? We just do. Yes. And I think it's so important to us because it bond, that one little connection with a cat or a dog or a bird or something, through that connection, we're, we're, integrated into the whole world. You know, it's like we're part of the whole mass of of living things somehow. And we we learn that I think not from each other so much because we can see our people see themselves as very separate from the rest of the living living world. But when we have that animal there, we know we're not. We know we're connecting with something that's going I, yeah. I love watching the men develop a relationship with the dust bunny <laughs> o over time. It seems like they're, they're the, the relationship is usually dust bunny with, with your, you know, heroine. Yeah, yeah. And then having this man have to kind of, uh, you know. I think it all fun. probably goes back to the, all those horse books I read when I was yeah. a <laughs> <laughs> I always had the psychic bond with this um, yeah. with this My horse. friend Flicka or the other? No, <laughs> the, the Black Stallion. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, Black yeah. Stallion, yeah. 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 The Walter Walter Farley wasn't it? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 They're, they're more like you are. They always like to have three or four, yeah. uh, three or four waiting. Um, people who read for pleasure are kind of addicted to it. I mean, it, yes. it is. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's, other people will bomb on the movies or, yeah. or something, yeah. but um, those of us who learn to read for pleasure are actually, I think, very lucky because it's one of the few personal. That just you just need you in the book. You know, yeah. um, that's, a movie is almost always better with somebody else, you know, like, it's like, um, and I also think the movie's done for you. The book you can just kind of play and interpret and decide, I'm going to linger on this part, or, you know, I, I, it just, it, there's a, there's a bond, there's a creative interaction instead of just sitting and watching. Plus, you bring something yeah. to it, you bring something to it, and interestingly, uh, one of the things I've learned in the past few years, which I didn't know going in, I guess intuitively you all know, but I didn't learn it until, or think of it coherently until I had to think about something else involving uh, doing a writer's workshop, um, how important fictional landscapes are to people, and the easiest, and if it's not a fictional landscape that you enjoy, 
you don't care if your favorite author wrote the book. It's, it's very, and a classic example is Robert B. Parker, who wrote these great, uh, Spencer, remember Spencer? Yes. Mm -hmm. Great mysteries. Well, he did a couple of other contemporary settings. There was a Jesse Stone mystery series. But he also had a series of westerns going called Appaloosa. And I loved his writing. I never read one western because I just don't read westerns. And it made me stop and think that even I, knowing as much about the business and knowing that it would be his voice, and my editor who edited him said, Jane, it's just Spencer on a horse. <laughs> and I said, Spencer doesn't develop all on a horse. <laughs> um, but what I'm getting at is that the genre, the, the fictional landscapes we love, we bring a lot into the story because we've read those landscapes before by other authors. For example, um, we all know the Sherlock Holmes landscape. Most of us can step into that landscape either in the movie or in the books, you know, because we know we know the Victorian world. We bring a lot to that story that the, the writer doesn't even have to explain. It's just she knows her readers will know it. Uh, same with the contemporary world. In the, when, you, when the people do talk about historicals, um, there's really only a couple, there's really only the 19th century that has become really super popular. And it's because it's close enough to our way of thinking of the changes that were leading to the 21st century were already kind of happening back in the 19th century, so we can key into them real fast. But if you take, um, you take another, take the 16th century, you're gonna really cut your readership down because a lot of people just feel that's an alien world to them. Yeah. Medieval world works, we, most of us have had enough um, of the, um, the taste of the medieval world in, I don't know, like Game of Thrones type stuff, you know, or, we've had that for years, so we can usually step into a medieval landscape, but the most popular landscape is either Regency England, which is the first part of the 19th century, or um, the late Victorian period, which is right at the cusp of the 20th century when everything changed. And if, if the easiest way, to, I think, to explain fictional landscapes is to look at people who read mysteries. Because you have your British police procedurals, yeah. you have your American police procedurals. And you can tell them apart because in the British police procedurals, the cops are the good guys. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that whole thing about having the dirty cop, that's yeah. American uh, tradition, man. And, and the attorney. <laughs> um, then we have, and the private eye story which is another very distinctive story, also a very American story. You do not see similar, even though the UK had um, Sherlock Holmes and really could lay claim to having started the private eye story, it's the American version that has become the most imitated and the most popular. Is, is that Raymond Chandler? He still, yeah, he, he was, yeah, but it was starting before Raymond Chandler. He, Raymond Chandler's claim to fame is he made it legitimate for academics to read <laughs> mysteries. Before that, they were cheesy paperbacks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So, anyhow, fictional landscapes are, for what it's worth, are very important. How do you decide um, to, like you were talking about having your books, a bunch of your books set in the San Juans, but you make up an island? Yeah. <laughs> Why, why, why would I make up an island? Because yeah. I don't want to get that. It just to be exact. <laughs> I could invent my own landscape. Um, and also, I don't have to worry about accidentally offending somebody or having them think I borrowed their house for that scene or put them into that cafe. I mean, people can Does be that funny. happen a lot? No, but I'm not going to take any chance on this. Because yeah. one of the things, I, one of the workshops I was at, um, you could submit your stuff and have a, a real editor look at it. Uh -huh. And um, and she was telling me about all the research you had to do to make sure that everything in your Actual stuff yeah. was real and that you had to have real street names, you had to have... Oh, <laughs> that's nonsense. Yeah. Well, you know that. I was curious. Yeah. Popular book. Where'd you go, Bernadette? Or where have you gone, Bernadette? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, set in, theoretically, in, well, most of it's Seattle, part of Antarctica. But you know, I mean, just like they drive from West Seattle to the East Side in two minutes, like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, so you know, I mean, they, they take huge liberties with you know what yeah. Seattle is and where you. But it's kind of almost. 
humorous or entertaining, but if I didn't live in Seattle, I would never know that. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I find it really distracting yeah. when it's yeah. real, but there's something off about it. Yeah, if you're going to do real, you're yeah. going to do real. Well, and I think that's what this woman was yeah. saying. She, well, yeah, I, I mean, I can see it from that point of view. If you're going to if, if you're going to invent streets in downtown Seattle, that would be that would be dumb. I mean, that that would yeah. that wouldn't fly. Um, but I invent towns all the time, okay. and then I could do do whatever I want. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I thought um, snow falling on cedars. Mm -hmm. I thought that was very subtle how they use the locations um, on Bashan and uh, without really identifying. Where too much about yeah, but you can still get a full picture yeah of, of what was happening. And it, it depends on the type of fiction you're trying to write too. Mm -hmm. If you're setting it in the historical context, um, you do want to be faithful to some of the history. <laughs> you, know, you don't want to go too far off. Although I got to tell you, <laughs> I've taken some wild turns in my writing <laughs> simply because um, if you stick by the history, it's especially the social history of the time, it can be very confining. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. and you're almost always trying to put a pretty modern thinking woman into the 19th yeah. century and a pretty modern thinking man into that era. So you kind of, you're working against what was really going on. You're working against history right away. For example, you probably won't have a lot of problems with typhoid or, mm -hmm. what was the other one? Cholera? Is that a big one? Like, yeah. Can cholera. you show an ankle? Yeah. 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 Show an ankle. Oh, I, uh, as a parting gesture, I will give you um, um, an interesting history of the corset. I was going to ask about that. Yeah. You were so yeah. Good. yeah, everybody thinks it was some kind of um, <laughs> maniacal device, you know, that was invented to keep women uh, pure. It was all social fashion. I got to tell you, there's a book out called How to Be a Victorian. And this woman, she's a historian, and she took it upon herself to live like a Victorian for a oh whole year. And one of them was wearing the corset. She says, oh, my Lord and Taylor. She says, once you've been in one of those things and know what it can do for you, <laughs> you will never go back. <laughs> and you know one of the things it does? It dips in corsets, the, 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 kind of, the, yeah. the, the formal corset dips down in the back. What this does <laughs> is makes it possible for you to sit perfectly erect yes. and relax. Because it holds you up. <laughs> you're all held in place. You can sit for hours. And look like <laughs> she said there was a reason they wore them. <laughs> what, what? But along with that weight, almost 40 pounds of clothes. Oh, yeah. A formally dressed woman going out on the street to shop in late Victorian England would have had 35, 40 pounds of clothes. That is almost as much as men carry into battle on their backs. That's almost like a backpack. And, and they had to have three people dress them. <laughs> yes, yeah. it was not something you could do. Yeah. yeah. Well, women were kind of in battle in those days anyway. Yes. You know, for their rights. It was a different battle, right? Yeah. 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 But, but apparently there was something going for the corset that was in <laughs> You definitely needed servants if you were um, have Well, them. and you had them, you know? Yeah. Yes. Yes. You have them. Yes. It shows class, doesn't it, certain? Oh, well, thanks, thanks for doing it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.